Jesus can ask me to give my life for him and tell me that I'm safe and both are true at the same time because he sees the eternally existent me. He knows the me that will exist after this earth and so he can both demand my life on earth and say I'm safe because both are true at the same time. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help, right now on The Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Welcome again to The Voice of the Martyrs Radio. My name is Todd Nettleton, and we're in the studio today in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, for a, a very special conversation with Dr. Pam Arland. Dr. Pam is the Global Training and Research Leader for All Nations International. That was the agency that sent John Chow to North Sentinel Island. And uh, if you receive the Voice of the Martyrs magazine, you already know that coming up is the Day of the Christian Martyr. We are honoring this year the legacy and the memory of John Chow. And so uh, I thought, what a, what a great way to honor his memory uh, by talking to Pam and talking about how he was trained, how he was recruited, how he was sent out, uh, and some of the preparation that went into John's ministry in North Sentinel Island. Pam, welcome back. I know you were here just a few weeks ago. Welcome back to Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Thank you. It's glad to be back. So, Tell us a little bit about those those initial conversations with John. Talk about your process of sort of getting to know him and, and kind of trying to sense, is, is this really what God is calling John to? Is this something all nations should be a part of sending him? Just talk us through that process a little bit. Man, I was just so impressed with all of the things that he listed and all the research that he had already done just in the midst of that first conversation. For one thing, I said, well, what have you read? And he said, here, and he snapped a photo and he sent me a pile of like 15 books. And I said, I mean, have you already read all of those books? And every single one of them was a book I would have recommended. It was like a missions classic. Wow. And I said, when are you gonna finish that pile? And he's like, well, I figure by next week I'll have it done. And he did actually, cause I followed up with him and he had read all of them immediately. And he started talking about uh, different trainings he'd taken, including like EMT training, wilderness training, linguistics training, and he had just done so many different things. And then we began to broach the topic of, um, well, what you know equipment would you need to get there, and what equipment would you take? And I, and I, of course, I didn't know the answer to that, but he had already had some detailed plans. And so then we began to broach the topic of what about outside illnesses? What would you do about that? And he had a plan for that. And then I said, well, that all sounds great. Like, what can I even offer you? <laughs> and he said, because once they accept me and I'm there long term, I need to know how to learn the language and how to learn the culture and how to help with people who don't know how to read and write, engage with Jesus and engage with the scriptures. And I said, ah, that's what I know how to do. The beach landing was just the beginning of getting accepted. And once he got accepted, he wasn't sure what to do after that. So I said, yeah, we can help you with that part. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Dr. Pam Arlen. She is the Global Training and Research Leader for All Nations International. They are the ministry that sent John Chow out. John Chow, whose legacy we are honoring and celebrating this year on Day of the Christian Martyr. The level of thought and intentionality that he put into this is something that is was completely ignored in after his death in in the storytelling about it the just the years of preparation and planning that went into it yeah and i think part of the reason it got ignored was because that was kind of john's plan yes. <laughs> was that he would be ignored right and he deliberately kind of cultivated this online persona to deflect away from his real mission. And his online persona was kind of the wild adventure, and he deliberately kept everything about his preparation and his calling offline. And so, you know, people just hear a story in the news and immediately they get on the internet and think everything that needs to be known is gonna be on the internet. But you and I know that we work a lot with brothers and sisters all around the world who are persecuted 
And those stories are nowhere on Facebook or Instagram or anywhere on the Internet. And so to get to the real stories, you're going to have to talk to the people who knew them. His thought, and I find this interesting, wasn't necessarily because of him. It was because of whoever would go after him to North Sentinel Island. He didn't want to create a barrier for them or or put any stumbling blocks in their way. And so if he was just assumed to be an adventurer that got too far off the trail— then that's great. Nobody would say, hey, there's Christians who are trying to get to that island, and it wouldn't cause any problems for anybody down the road. Almost the very last thing he said, which he said in print, is why we know that he said it was, who will come after me? Who will take my place? And so he was thinking multi-generationally. You know, if, if I can stay, that's great. But if I can't stay, then who will be the next generation who will pick up this task? And I think that that's what we're still trying to find out. Mm-hmm. Um, who will be the next generation? We know that there will be one. We know that the Lord will reach these folks. We know that they will be in the New Jerusalem someday, right? Every tribe and tongue and nation. Uh, And John prayed for the people in in his journal. He prayed for the people who would come after him. Lord, give them a double portion. Give them a double anointing. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Dr. Pam Arlen. She is the Global Training and Research Leader for All Nations International. She has also recently published a book, Stick Figures Save the World. And the subtitle of that is actually, it's Jesus Who Saves the World, but it is a book about sharing gospel stories with simple drawings that cross language barriers, cross cultural barriers. Uh, So I would encourage you to pick up a copy of that book. Again, it's called Stick Figures Save the World. You can also find All Nations online at allnations.international. We'll give you a link when you come to vomradio.net as well. Pam, We've shared some stories about John, but but what do you remember about him? What what was he like for those of us who won't get the chance to meet him this side of eternity? What what are some of the things you remember about him? Not only was John a planner, but he was also very what I would call winsome to the extent that children were just attracted to him. They children just felt safe around him. You wouldn't think that from somebody who's, you know, like, let me get EMT training, let me get wilderness training. But he was extremely calm and joyful in the midst of a very intense outlook on life as well. And it challenged me personally because I have a tendency to maybe just be like too intense. Um, And it makes me think, no, there's joy in our intensity with Christ. And I thought that he had this beautiful balance of being focused and being joyful at the same time. Which is pretty unique. I mean, you don't see that in a lot of people, that that those two sides to that coin. Yeah. And so I think that's one of the things that we can learn from John and can help us to grow. And as we grow in being both focused and joyful, being intense and joyful, I think we honor John and what he deposited, not only for the North Sentinelese, but for us. Yeah, it's beautiful. Let's talk a little bit about the the time right after John went to the island, right after he was killed. We mentioned the fact that in in his mind, this was like secret. Nobody was ever going to know if if he got killed. It would just be, well, he was lost at sea or, oh, he's an adventurer. Then the whole story comes out. All Nations is inundated with attention, probably more attention than you ever wanted. Oh, yeah. What were those days like for you and for others on the leadership team there at All Nations? Yeah, those days immediately following John's death, we had thought, if we lose this brother, we will be very sad, and that will be really terrible, and we'll deal with it, and nobody will notice. That's what we thought, because normally when people are persecuted, nobody notices, right? We've got dozens of cases a day that nobody notices, so we were shocked at the backlash, and it was a backlash that came from two sources. And one was this very liberal stream of non-Christians who were, and we had eco-terrorists threatening to bomb our offices. And honestly, I didn't even know what an eco-terrorist was. (laughs) I'd never even heard of an eco-terrorist before. Um, But they're basically, you know, saying like people who are not contacted, should just be left alone, and how could you possibly bother them and disturb their blissful state of existence, which of course is is not true that they have a blissful state of existence or else they wouldn't be acting in fear the way they are. 
But the stream that surprised us was the Christian stream that was so opposed to what we had done, um, or it was more specifically what John had done, and we had assisted him to do. So that's us together. Christians didn't even pause to get the whole story. Uh, and people were making comments saying, well, clearly John didn't know what he was doing. Well, all they had was, you know, 30 seconds on the ABC <laughs> Evening News. And his Instagram feed. And his Instagram feed. And we're drawing conclusions and making statements that were quite strong and quite emphatic. And that part took us by surprise. And that part created a whole second layer of grieving that we weren't expecting to have to process or go through. And that part in the end, cost us a lot more money, a lot more time, and a lot more effort. And honestly, it was weeks into it before we all paused to just be like, wait a minute, we, we lost John because we had to fight that uh, media battle just right away. How do you respond? And I won't even, I don't even bother with the echo terrorist folks. <laughs> but the, the thing that concerns me is people in the church who said, the Great Commission maybe doesn't apply anymore, or it doesn't apply if the people have never been contacted, or how do you respond to the criticism from the church? Because it seems like the church should be celebrating. Here's a man who heard Jesus call to go into all the world and was willing to lay down his life. And you read his journals, and he knows, I might die tomorrow, but these people are worth it. Jesus is worth it. And the church says, John was foolish. John was an idiot. What was he doing there? How do you respond to that? Or how did you kind of try to bounce back from that? Yeah, so there's multiple layers there, right? So we've already talked about how John wasn't foolish. So I think we can leave that aside for now. But the fact that there are people who say that they love and obey Jesus, but don't even believe in the Great Commission is deeply disturbing to me. Because if we really do think that Jesus has saved us just theologically, but secondly, that he fills us with joy and sustains us day in and day out. If we really believe that, how could we not want that for every people group on earth? And so, like, I often ask people, like, you know, what's your cutoff date? If you had Jesus before 1968, then you're fine. But if you didn't get Jesus before 1968, too bad for you. You don't really need him. Um, so I think often what happens is a couple different things. We have a consumerist mentality of Christ himself. Christ's job is to make me happy and give me a great future, which is actually sometimes he does that. And Jesus definitely does bless us, but he doesn't always bless us financially, and he doesn't always bless us with safety on this earth. Um, we have a great future, but it might not be here on earth. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that I think just amazes me that I wrapped my brain around at one point is that Jesus can ask me to give my life for him and tell me that I'm safe, and both are true at the same time. Because he sees the eternally existent me. He knows the me that will exist after this earth. And so he can both demand my life on earth and say I'm safe because both are true mm -hmm. at the same time. Wow. And I think a lot of people haven't really wrapped their brain around this eternal existence that we have. You know, recently I was with uh, some brothers and sisters in Bangladesh, and many of them said to me, uh, straight from Scripture, you know, we're like flowers who wither and fade away. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's the Bible. That's what the Bible <laughs> says about us. Um, and our lives here are short. Um, and that's okay that our life here is short because heaven, I'm pretty sure, is going to be a whole lot better anyway. And I just want to make sure that whether I live a long time or I live a short time, that I'm obedient to Jesus. And because it's he's worth it. He's just so beautiful and so amazing. I just want to be all in with him. And certainly that was John's attitude as well. He is worth it. I'm all in with him. Whatever he calls me to do, I'm going to do it. I don't care what you think about it. I don't care what it costs me. I'm going to do what Jesus called me to do. Were there any of the decisions— that you second guessed in in the weeks and months after John's death? Was there anything that you thought, man, I wish we would have done this, or I, we could have done this, or was there anything that you thought, maybe we would do that differently if we had it to do again? You know, given the resources and the information that we had at the time, I think we made the best decisions that we possibly could. Uh, but it's interesting how technology has already changed, um, and we probably could gather more information or gather that information differently. 
Uh, but we do know that uh, we did our best given the resources and the information that were available. And we counted that cost and revisited that cost several times. And I think, you know, in the article that you so beautifully put together that you put out, you mentioned that we asked the question near the end, are we sure? Are we sure? And the only response was the correct response that Dr. Mary Ho, our international executive leader, gave is, you know, how are they going to hear unless someone preaches, unless someone offers them Jesus? And so that was our bottom line, that if they're going to hear, somebody's going to have to go. And we did everything we could to try to be wise. We did everything we could to try to offer gifts, to create, you know, this understanding. And one of the things that I think we need to pause and remember is that John was physically strong and John was capable of, you know, hunting things <laughs> and he was capable of catching fish and he chose to go without a single weapon. He chose to make sure that he had nothing on him that would look intimidating or scary and that he knew he could take a weapon and maybe he could hide a weapon, but he wasn't going to do that. He was willing to give himself if necessary for these folks. Which then to be charged as a colonizer or someone who is trying to, you know, plant the flag for Westernism in uh, on the island is just a, a bit of a joke. But I'm thankful to hear that. I, I'm thankful to hear that you you don't feel like you have to wrestle with it anymore or feel like you have to go back and think, oh, man, I wish oh, wish if we'd have known this or just that that there is that peace that you have that – Yes, it was a hard decision, and yes, it was a hard loss, but we did what God called us to do. Yeah, and we do have that peace, and I think it's not only me, uh, and I think it's not only all nations, but I think it's everybody who ever knew John. Um, I've never yet met a person who's like, oh, John, he shouldn't have done that. I mean, every person I've ever talked to said, that young man knew what he was doing, he was called, and he was prepared. And yeah, we miss him because we enjoyed him and we would like to be with him again, uh, but we'll have to wait till heaven to be with him again. And every person I've ever met is just so grateful that they had the opportunity to meet and know John Chow while he was here on earth. And I'm excited that everybody listening to this will eventually get to meet John Chow and get to know the beautiful young man that I got the pleasure of knowing while he was still here on earth. One of the quotes that I included in the article that, that really blessed me is from one of his college classmates. And she said, you would leave time with John and she would pray, Lord, make me more like John. I want to be like him. I want to have a heart like he has. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Dr. Pam Arlen. She is the global training and research leader for All Nations International. They are the ministry that sent John Chow to North Sentinel Island. We have also had, and Pam mentioned her, Dr. Mary Ho, the international executive leader. She has been with us here on Voice of the Martyrs Radio. You can find that interview at vomradio.net. Pam, let's go back to the criticism a, a little bit. How much do you worry about the North American church that would offer those criticisms? Why would you go? Why would you lay down your life? Why wouldn't you leave those people alone? They're they're living peacefully on that island by themselves. How much do you worry about our churches that that, that kind of thought can can grow up out of them? I, I am deeply worried about not only our North American churches, but our churches in Europe, um, churches in other places around the world. Because, I mean, you and I both know that it, it's, it's a kind of a pithy saying, but it is true that if you don't have anything worth dying for, you also don't have anything worth living for. And to think that Jesus is just a – he's the one who gives to us and he gives us just this safe and happy life, I think is such an impoverishment – of who he is and what his kingdom is like. And I think his actual kingdom where he promised you on this earth you will have many troubles is actually a deeper, more beautiful kingdom uh, than this shallow one where it's just about my happiness and about me being comfortable and about me being safe. And I think it's honestly one of the joys is when you step out of the boat 
And when you step out of the boat and you get that intimacy with him, because you have to lock eyes with him to stay safe on the water with him, that's when following Jesus actually gets really beautiful. And so whatever is a little bit just beyond our comfort zone, whatever leads us out just even a smidge beyond our comfort zone, often leads to deeper intimacy with Jesus. And so I think we're robbing ourselves of a deeper love life with the creator of the universe uh, by just thinking his job is just to bless us and make us happy. (laughs) Amen. I love it that you talked about stepping out of the boat. And as we think about John stepping out of the boat that last time and swimming, literally swimming to shore, saying, okay, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen this morning, but I'm willing to be here. I'm willing to go if that's what you're calling me to do. Pam, there's a whole generation of missionaries that were inspired by the five men who were killed on a river beach in Ecuador more than 50 years ago now, Uh, the story that's told in the book Through Gates of Splendor. Obviously, it hasn't been 50 years since John's passing. Are are you seeing any of that? Is all nations hearing from young people who say, hey, I read John's story, I want to go, God's calling me to go as well. Are you seeing any of that already, or is that maybe something we'll see in the years to come? You know, we are seeing some of that, but even just recently, I was uh, teaching in Colorado, and a group of young people came up to me, and they said, "Uh, we heard that John Chow was basically just a crazed maniac who went off on his own, and we've we've, we've sat around and had long discussions about what a crazed maniac he was, and we don't want to be like him. And so if you know young people, would you please share this podcast with them so that they can get the true story? Would you please share the article with them so that they can get the true story? And I said, come on over here and sit down and let me tell you the true story of John Chow. And so I think a lot of young people are still only getting that other version of John being a crazed maniac, which is not true. And so now that we know, now that you who've listened to this podcast know that John loved and obeyed Jesus and was well-prepared. Please share that story with young people who need to hear it. We've been talking today with Dr. Pam Arlen. She is the Global Training and Research Leader for All Nations. Pam, we always like to end with prayer. And, you know, I want people to pray for the people of North Sentinel Island, that Absolutely. that God will reveal himself to them, that that God will call up others to go in John's place. But as we think about other unreached people groups, maybe can you give us some some specific thoughts as we pray for those who've never heard or the groups who the Bible's not in their language. They they don't have ready access to the gospel. How do we pray for God's work among those type of people? You know, most of the people who haven't yet heard of Jesus, there's a reason. They live in a highly persecuted country. They're on an island in the middle of an ocean. They're high in the mountains. So we need to be praying for access and good ideas on how to get to those places and be willing to live in difficult places, be willing to endure hardships. So pray that God would raise up the kind of people who hear his voice and are willing to endure hardship for him. And then pray that they would have the skill set to stay long-term, to learn the language, to initiate Bible translation. Bible translation is just so needed. And that's not something you just pick up and do, you know, based on like a weekend seminar, right? (laughs) That's something that really needs years and years of training. And so pray that uh, young people could pay for that training. I mean, we, we ask them to pay for the training themselves and then to go translate the Bible with no salary. That's what we ask them to do. Uh, so pray that they could get the training and be willing to go. You have a PhD in linguistics. How, how long did that take? How long was that process? That process altogether was about a decade. And wow. it wasn't, you know, full time, but it was two years of a master's degree, um, years of writing a dissertation, another year of classes for a PhD. Um, yeah, it's it's a highly— It's a long process. It's a long process. Uh, but it is a necessary process um, to do it right yep. and to do it well. So, yeah, let's pray that God would raise up more and more Bible translators. We've been talking this week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Dr. Pam Arlen. She is the global training and research leader for all nations. She is also the author of a book called Stick Figures Save the World. We'll give you a link to the book when you come to vomradio.net. 
We will also give you a link to some of the resources we have about John Chow for the Day of the Christian Martyr. We have mentioned the article from our magazine, from the June issue of the Voice of the Martyrs magazine. We also have a short video sharing his story that you can share with your church, with your Bible study group, with young people that you know. And so I would encourage you, come to vomradio.net. Take advantage of some of those resources as we honor the legacy and the heroism and the courage of John Chow this month on Day of the Christian Martyr. And I hope you'll be back with us next week right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.